Amen. How great thou art. Brother Brian, great job. It's great to have the Harbors here. They're visiting from Pennsylvania. You guys are right in that Gettysburg area, right? Do I live right by Gettysburg? Yeah. Harrisburg, Harrisburg now. Okay, so a little bit of a move lately. Well, great to have you guys here. They're here visiting family. What a blessing, huh? I'm looking at Vicki's smiling face, and it's, it's great. Well, thank you again for that. What a blessing. All right, uh, we're going to turn to uh, First Kings. Brother Victor, you have your hand up. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah, thank you for that, Victor. Yes, I, we're so happy for you, Brandon. I'm glad everything turned out well, and you had that appendectomy, and everything turned out great. So praise the Lord. Yes, and they'll be heading out tomorrow. So pray for them as they travel. All right, great. Okay, so first, uh, first Kings, First Kings chapter twelve, First Kings chapter twelve. I mentioned that I'm going to bring a couple of messages here today. Uh, of course, one this evening, uh, in regard to our theme here, and our theme is to finish strong. It's uh, it's an important thing to finish strong. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good thing for us, and I think we we do this. Uh, we might drop the ball here and there, uh, but when we raise our kids, those of us that are parents. Or when you work with somebody on a project, listen, we always encourage them to finish the job, right? So let me just say this, parents, uh, be careful when you, when you give your kids a project that you make sure that they get that done, that they finish it. Otherwise, you're teaching them not the best lessons, you know, if you're not teaching them to finish up what they've started. So uh, again, that's just a little tidbit of you know, common sense knowledge, all right, that we, that we would learn how to finish, but that we would finish in a, in, a, in a good way, that we would finish in a positive way, that we would finish strong, because that's what the Lord wants for us. It was just a couple of weeks ago that I taught a Sunday school class uh, on expectation, and I'm not going to get into that, of course, here this morning, but the Lord has an expectation for every one of us, and that expectation really that's a broad sweeping expectation that he has for every single person. He wants the best for every person. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, God wants all men to be saved. So he has a great expectation for he wants everyone to be saved. He died for all. Amen. The Lord Jesus did. But also in our lives, he wants what's best and he wants us to finish well. So we're going to look at an illustration or maybe an example today of somebody who didn't quite finish well. I'll just kind of give you that right at the, at the offset here, uh, or the outset. Uh, but tonight, we will be looking at somebody who finished well. So here we are in 1 Kings chapter 12 uh, about uh, the importance of finishing well. So here's a story. It takes place uh, really in a bad time in Israel's history. Uh, the nation had, or the kingdom, had just been divided. And that happened because... You had, really, on Solomon's watch, uh, things went south, all right? You had King Saul, and King Saul didn't turn out to be a very good king, so the Lord chose him another king. And who was that? Yeah, that was King David. And, and King David, and also, by the way, Saul ruled for 40 years, but basically he was disqualified shortly after he even took the reign, all right, because he just wouldn't listen to the things of God. And then David took over, and he was a man after God's own heart. And he wasn't perfect by all means, but he had a, he had a heart for God, and God blessed him. And so David uh, reigned for 40 years as well, and then Solomon is going to reign for 40 years. And Solomon really was off to a good start, really for the first 20, and probably even a little bit past that, but then he went astray. Do you remember what his big downfall was? There was like about a thousand of them. <laughs> Yeah, well, he married a lot of strange women, uh, strange wives, and he began to go after their gods, all right? So we're not going to go down that road, but because of what happened, the Lord said, I'm going to split the kingdom because of Solomon, but he wouldn't do it under his reign. He says, I'll do it under your son's reign, and his son was Rehoboam, and Rehoboam wasn't a good man, so it wasn't like, wow, he got the short end of the stick. No, Rehoboam didn't really live for the Lord at all, all right? So the kingdom gets split. Uh, on his watch, and we'll just take a look. He, uh, 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 Jeroboam, now Rehoboam is going to rule, rule over Judah, and then also Benjamin's a part of that, 
and then the 10 other nations are going to go and be led by a man by the name of Jeroboam, all right? Jeroboam is going to be his king, so, or their king. And so it's easy to remember, you have Rehoboam and then Jeroboam. They're not related. They just have the same ending on their names. And so uh, Jeroboam becomes the king of Israel, and he, pretty, uh, he decides pretty quickly how he will run the nation. He has opportunities, and the Lord speaks to him uh, about following him. And if he follows him, he will bless him. But he doesn't do that. He has two golden calves that are made uh, so that Israel would worship them. He didn't want them to take that regular trek to Jerusalem and maybe turn back to the Lord. So he sets up some golden calves uh, from Bethel all the way up to Dan. And that's what they're going to worship. So here in 1 Kings chapter 12, it says here in verses 28 through 30, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods. These will be your gods. O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And so then he, uh, he goes out and ordains a feast on a set day. And we'll read those verses here, verses 31 through 33 to to, to just kind of uh, uh, establish this, uh, the, the, you know, what he has already put into action. So it says here in verses 31 through 33 as we finish this chapter, And he made an house of high places, and he made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam or, ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the, the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. And he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. And so we're going to go right into chapter 13 because chapter 13 just continues right on uh, in this narrative. But with that, let's have a word of prayer and let's go before the Lord. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather. Lord, we thank you for those of us that know you as our Savior. We thank you for what you've given to us. You've given to us eternal life in Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on that cross for our sins, that you were buried, and that you rose again, and that you're at the right hand of the Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you're our great Savior. Now, we would pray for anybody here without, without you. They don't know you as their personal Savior. We pray that you'd work in their hearts. We pray that they'd come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior as well. And we pray that they would even make that decision today. So we pray, Father, that you'd bless. We pray as we learn about this story with this man of God that we're going to read about and we see his example. Lord, there's some great example uh, in the first part of his life, but then we see some things happen a little further down. And so we pray, Father, that you'd speak to our hearts, draw us close to Christ. We pray that he would be glorified through all of this, and I pray for the Spirit of God to do his work today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So I want us to take a look at this man, we're going to look at a man that's called a man of God. And he is sent by the Lord to now go right to Jeroboam because Jeroboam has set it in place and he's ordained all this that this is the route we're going to go. I'm going to set up two golden calves and that's what you're going to worship. He had an opportunity to live for the Lord and he uh, turned away from that. He said, no, no, I'm going to go my own direction. And that's what he chooses to do. So right as all of this is happening and they have this feast and they are, you know, celebrating the, the, this, the, the king and the decisions that he's made, well, the Lord sends somebody to him. And we're going to take a look at this man of God and we're going to see three scenes that take place in his life. So we see here that, uh, first of all, we're going to take a look at the man of God, victorious. Okay, we're going to see the beginning of this, uh, this man that we don't even know his name, but we're going to see the victory that God gives to him. We're going to see how he responded to the Lord, and he did what God called him to do. 
So we're going to take a look here at verse 1, and it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. All right, so there comes this man of God as all of this is happening right at the end of, of, of chapter 12. And as it heads into chapter 13, it just continues on. So this man of God shows up on the scene. And uh, again, as I said, we don't know his background. We don't even know his name. It's never brought up in the whole passage. And this is the only place that you read about this man of God. Uh, this man of God was sent to deliver a message. He's sent to deliver a message uh, of judgment to Jeroboam. And uh, not an easy message, mind you. Uh, some messages are certainly easier to deliver than others. But this was a message of judgment. And he is coming and he's looking directly and confronts the king of Israel. And I personally believe without a doubt that this man was a faithful man. I don't believe that the Lord uh, called somebody who, you know, hadn't, hadn't really had any life experiences in, in being a, a preacher and a man of God. I believe this man was, was a faithful man of God. That's, that's who God uses, I think. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 10, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Right? Isn't that a, uh, that, that's so clearly laid out, uh, that concept, that God says that if you're faithful in that which is least to start off with, you'll be faithful in something that is much more broader, something that is more detailed. Amen? Right. And that's how things work in this life. You bring people along. You start them off small. You want to prove somebody. You want to see how well they do in something that's maybe not as significant as something that you maybe have planned down the road because you want to see that they're faithful. You want to see that they're faithful with little. And down the road, you want them certainly to be faithful with much. So what an honor it really was for this prophet to be used by God. It was a dangerous mission, as I mentioned. He's going to come and he's going to stand before a king and a king, you know, wields an awful lot of power. And he's already made this decision where he's going to go. But I believe that this man had learned how to be faithful in the small things first. And so often, we, and a lot of, maybe, maybe we're not always guilty of it, but a lot of people are, is people want to get right to the top. Without having to take those steps. You know, without having to go through those hard, uh, through those hard yards. No, you've got to go through it before you get there. So I believe we've got a faithful man here. So what we have before us and the lesson that we should learn is we want to be faithful in whatever it is that God's called us to do. Yes. Amen? Right. Whatever it is that God has put on your plate, then I want to challenge you today to be faithful with it. Amen. We all have some small things and then we have some bigger things. And as we go along in life... Hopefully, they become bigger and they become broader and they become more significant. But may we learn how to be faithful uh, all the steps along the way. Dependable. It's important to be dependable in the things that God has called us to. So I speak to husbands. I speak to wives. I speak to dads. I speak to moms. I speak about the things that we're called to do. Obviously, right there in the family, raising children. Uh, what about ministering to people? Are we faithful in the things that God has opened up a door for us to do? We have an opportunity to reach out to somebody, to somebody. In some way, in some form or some fashion, are we faithful to do that? Uh, do, we, uh, do we answer the call when God has called us to do things? What about just some of the things that we're to do on a regular basis? How many of you Without a doubt, or how many of you all just ask the question and believe it's the right thing to do when we talk about reading our Bibles? All right. Now, I'm not going to ask you this next question. I'm not here to embarrass anybody, but maybe you're not reading your Bible faithfully. Maybe that's just something right there that you say to yourself, you know what? I need to be faithful in reading my Bible. Not that that's a small thing. That's a huge thing. But being faithful in reading our Bible. Amen. What about faithful in praying every day? Are you faithful to pray every day? How many of you think that that's an important thing to do? Yeah, every hand's going to go up on that, right? Uh, what about young people? What about, I look at, see some young people around here. What about the importance of what God tells us to do? It was one of our verses, uh, memory verses last uh, month. 
And that is, how important is it for young people or kids to obey their parents? Right? That's important. Now, you know, nobody's going to bat a thousand with that. But when you fail, you get it right. And it's good to go to mom and dad and say, forgive me. I, you know, you told me to do this. And I, 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 for lack of another word, copped a bad attitude. Remember that little term? <laughs> I copped a bad attitude or whatever. I had a bad attitude with this thing. And I didn't do the right thing. So let me encourage you, young people. Go to your parents and make sure that, you, that your heart's right. And then do the right things, and, you know, that's part of, of it right there. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 19 says this. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth. How many of you ever had a broken tooth? They're not really dependable when that, you know, when you're just taking a bite into a big steak, right? It's just like, just not there. Or an apple or whatever, something that's got some real you know, consistency to it. Yeah, it says, uh, a confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Any of you ever had a, uh, you know, your knee or your foot come out of joint? Yeah, you just can't stand on it, can you? No, and so is an unfaithful person. You can't put your confidence in them. How many of you want to be known as a... Uh, you know, uh, what's the word I want? You're just not dependable. How many of you want to be uh, not a very dependable person? No, good. I didn't see any hands, right? No, we want to be, you know, wouldn't you like it said about you or even thought by people about you that that person's dependable? I can ask them to do something and they're going to get it done. That's a good thing, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm just speaking common sense because it is so important. We want to be that kind of an individual. So I commend this servant of God by the fact that he was faithful to his call. He didn't shrink back. He was bold to call sin, sin. So we're going to take a look here in verses 2 and 3. So he comes, and as we see that Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and look what the man of God cries. This man of God doesn't just... Uh, whisper this out. Uh, he doesn't say it in a, uh, you know, uh, mundane or, you know, just a, a, a flat tone. No, no, no. He cries. He cries out. He says, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So he, uh, he just comes and preaches right at Jeroboam. And he preaches about the altar that would be rent and that's going to take place right when this happened. But he's also calling out somebody by name. Somebody that would take the bones out of that, out of the sepulcher that was right there and burn them upon the altar. And you know, that takes place some 350 years later. And he even has the name right. And that was King Josiah. And that would be in, in 1 Kings chapter 23. If you go further down into the book of 1 Kings, you go about 350 plus, or 300 plus years, maybe close to 350. And Josiah, this is a prophecy uh, about what Josiah was going to do. And I believe it's in verse 16. I didn't write the verse down, but you'll find that. And that's exactly what Josiah does. Now, uh, this 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 preacher, this man of God, he just comes and he just preaches the word. He doesn't care what anybody is thinking. He doesn't care uh, what, uh, what anybody uh, uh, thinks about him. He just comes and delivers the message. For all he knows, that king might just have his head taken off. All right? And it's very likely that Jeroboam was going to do something against him, as we're going to read in just a moment. But we're to call sin, sin. That's what we're to do. We're, we're, we're not to shirk it, shirk it or, uh, you know, resist it. Listen, uh, we're living in a day when we're living amongst a lot of wickedness right now. I'm having a hard time, and I haven't hardly watched. I've watched a little. We know a young gal 
that is, uh, was in my wife's class in first and second grade who's on the Olympic boxing team. And she already won her first match. And so, like, you mean Alicia's in her? Oh, man, we knew she was boxing. So we kind of want to see her now. You know, I think she's maybe 20 now or 19 or 20. And uh, so we're excited about that. But otherwise, I'm having a hard time watching these Olympics. All right? And, and I'm having a hard time, well, in boxing when there's a couple of men boxing some gals. I think that's pretty wicked where our world has gone. You know, this transgen transgender stuff. Listen, that's just out of the pit of hell. There's no other way about it. Uh, the things that we see in this life, you know, uh, whether it's uh, homosexuality or, man, I can name a whole lot of things. They're vile. It's wicked. Now, listen, we're to have a right heart because, listen, we're just sinners saved by the grace of God. And we're to love people, we're, whatever, wherever they're at, we're to love them and want to win them to Christ. But we could draw that line, I think you can draw it in just the right way. You can still have a Christ-like spirit, but be able to say, no, that's just wrong. And it's wicked. But I need to love those people and love them to Christ. I don't need to love their sin. And I'm not going to love their sin. So I appreciate what this man of God has done. He's come and he's called sin, sin. And that's what, what God has, has led him to do. And it's important for us as Christians, to call sin what it is. To tear off the mask that the world likes to cover sin with. And I don't want to go into politics, but it just seems like, man, you know, if you go into our government and you go into, you know, because it's all politics right now when you watch TV, not maybe all, but it just seems like people can just lie right through their teeth over and over again. Listen, God hates lying. It's an abomination to God. And we're, we're to speak the truth. We're to speak the truth in love, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. We're to be straightforward and honest. God hates it when we begin to shave off the truth and try to turn it just enough so it, maybe, it, uh, maybe it benefits us. No, no, no. Let's just, let's just shoot straight and do the right thing because that honors God. And so we need to just take off the, the, the mask that the, the world likes to put over everything. So I encourage you. And myself, listen, to be different. We're to be separate, saith the Lord, right? We're to come out from among them and be ye separate. So we're to be different. We're to stand up for Christ. And we're to stand up for righteousness and for godliness. Where you work and, and the, uh, the places that you frequent, uh, wherever it is you live, right in your home, be, just be who you are. Be faithful to the Lord. Be honest. Amen? Romans chapter 13 is a great verse, and it says this. Rather than have you turn there, I'll read it. But that's a great uh, uh, passage right there is Romans 13, 12. It says, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. God says, put on the armor of light. Be, you know, uh, live godly, live righteousness. Uh, or live righteously. So now we'll see the response of Jeroboam. We'll see his response here, who is the king of Israel. And verse uh, 4, we'll look at verse 4. And after this uh, man of God points out the sin that was happening there at the altar, and he preaches at the altar, and of course, as he's preaching to the altar, and he gives that, that prophecy about it, he's certainly preaching at Jeroboam. And it says in verse 4, and, and it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. So this is crazy what takes place. You know, you have Jeroboam, and he sees this man. Here he is, they're having this feast, all of this, uh, you know, uh, celebration going on uh, of wickedness. But all this celebration still going on nevertheless. And this man of God shows up and, and he begins to preach against that altar. And he begins to preach against the things of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam says, lay hold on that man. What do you think you are? And he's, you know, he reaches out his hand. He put forth his hand from him. You know he's pointing at him. And then it says in verse, uh, in verse 
uh, let me get, oh, no, that right here in the beginning of, or the, media, the, the middle of verse 4. Let's go right back there again. He says, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him, it dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. So as he's pointing to him and saying, what does this guy think he's doing? What do you think you're doing? Lay a hold of this man, and his hand just dries up. I mean, can you just picture that as he's pointing to the man? All of a sudden, his hand just is withered, and he's not even able to pull it in. It just dries up. And all of a sudden, his tone is totally different. He is like, what just happened? I can't even pull my arm in anymore. It's just like frozen stiff. So we go on to read right here that in verse 5, the altar also was rent. So right when this is happening, the altar rents in two. Now, the altar is not made out of cardboard. All right, the altar's made out of stone and plaster, all of those things that are put together, and this thing rents in two. So it says here in verse 5, the altar was also rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So the altar's rent in two right in front of everybody, and the ashes began to pour out. And so it continues on in verse 6, and the king answered and said unto the man of God, so his tone has totally changed because he says now to the man of God, entreat now the face of the Lord thy God. Would you please, please pray for me. Entreat God that he would do something for my hand, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. Now I'm just wondering if that man of God for a moment thought... Man, do I have to restore his hand again? I kind of like the fact of his, uh, you know, his attitude change. It's a lot more on my behalf now that his arm is all dried up. I kind of like to leave him in that position. So I'm sure he's probably thinking, Lord, do I have to do this? Well, either way, he prays, and, that, and the Lord was gracious enough to restore Jeroboam's hand the way that he was. So he, re he entreats, his hand is restored. And then the king does this in verse 7. And it says, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. So this whole thing now is going down a different road as far as the king's attitude. He realized that this man is a man of God, and look what this man did to me. And so he says, Listen, I want to give you a reward. Come home with me. And it says, the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. And then it says that he departs. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. So the king says... I'll bring it to my palace, I'll bring it to my home, and I will reward you. And the man of God says, no way, because God laid it very clearly out to me that I'm to come in and to preach against that altar, to preach against the things that you're doing, and then after I've delivered that message, I'm to go out another way, not the same way, but I'm going to head out and then take off, and I'm going to be gone. So you can give me half of your house, you can give me half of your riches, but no, no, the deal is no, and so he takes off, and and so he was victorious. Praise the Lord. He did what he was called to do. And that's how may it, it may be for us if we are just faithful to the Lord. God tells us that God will bless us. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ Jesus. The Lord says if we'll walk with the Lord and trust him, God will give us victory all along the way. Now I want us to take a look now at the next scene. The next scene, which unfortunately doesn't uh, come out so well for the man of God. It, it, turns, uh, it turns bad for the man of God. And we're going to take a look at the man of God greatly deceived. And so we take a look at verse 11. And it says that he's made up his mind. He's left town and he's headed out. But it says there's somebody that lives in Bethel that heard this news. And it says in verse 11, Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also 
to their father. So there's this old prophet that lives in Bethel, and he hears about what took place in this, uh, you know, in, in this uh, setting. And he wasn't there, but his sons were, and they come and they, they tell his, their dad, Dad, you should have seen what happened. Uh, that all of the festivities were taking place, and King Jeroboam had set those calves, and they had the, the feast was going on. But he said, this man of God shows up, and you should have heard him preach, just like you, Dad, way back in the day when we were kids. Wow. Because that's really how it goes forth here. Because when you read verses 12 through 14, it says, And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. So my question is, he finds him sitting under an oak tree, right? Uh, my question is, what is he doing under the oak tree? What is he doing under this oak tree? We're going to see that this guy should have gotten home. He should have just, you know, hightailed it and got right back to home, but he didn't. He comes and he, he rests under an oak tree, and that's where this old prophet finds him with his sons. Again, I'm not sure what he's doing under that tree, but I want us to think about that. And I'll bring that up and as the message goes forth in just a little bit. But listen, we are all tempted to maybe, what, bask in our victories? I'm not sure why he goes under that oak tree. It doesn't really tell us. But there's a whole lot uh, of, a, of a representation of him being under that, under that oak tree that would relate or make application to every one of us. Maybe the Lord gives you victory. Maybe the Lord gives me victory. But one of the foolish things that we would do is for us to bask over those victories as if we had something to do with it. it, it it's always good for us to, to turn to the Lord and to give Him the glory and to give Him the praise for whatever He does in our lives. Amen? Amen? I think of the preacher who was complimented by a lady in the congregation after he gave his message. And so later he told his wife, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, Mrs. Donaldson, uh, she said that I was a model preacher. Well, his wife re replied, well, a model is a small imitation of the real thing. So that kind of brought him back to earth real quickly. And that's good for us, but listen, we're like that. We're like that preacher, right? That's kind of how we are because our old nature loves to, uh, loves to gloat over our accomplishments if we're not careful. We can think about, wow, look what, look what just happened. Look what just took place. So the old prophet invites him to his house. Verses 15 through 17, as we continue on, verse 15, he says, Then he said unto him, Come home with me. He asked him, remember just the verse before, are you the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. So then he says to him, come home with me and eat bread. Almost a little bit of a similar pitch that the king gave to him. You're not going to give him a reward, but he says, I'll feed you. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. And then he says again what he said to the king, for it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. So he declines, and he, he holds true to what God had said to him. Go and deliver that message, and then get out of there and get back home. So when this man makes this pitch, this old prophet, he said, uh, no, I can't. God's already uh, instructed me and directed me what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to follow the Lord's instructions. But it says here at the beginning of 18, he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with thee into thine house. He said, bring, bring this man. An angel spoke to me. Bring this man back to my house. Uh, listen, the man of God, he had no problem with the king and the king's offer. And he said very, very clearly, no, no, God made it clear, uh, I'm not going to go back. And he refused the king's offer. But when it came to somebody who was of his own stripe, we'll say, 
uh, somebody who said, I, I'm a prophet as well. I'm a prophet just like you are. Then he became very vulnerable. He became very vulnerable. Uh, he, uh, he showered him with some compliments, no doubt. We heard some great things. My sons were there. Uh, they told me about uh, this message that you preach right at the king. And we heard about what took place with the altar. And so he's hearing these compliments from this old prophet. Someone once said this, when a man pats you on the back, nine times out of ten, he's trying to get you to cough up something. <laughs> Listen, we can all fall for flattery, can't we? Yeah, because we take a look here in verse 18, and he said, bring him back with thee. This angel said to me, bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water. But what does it say there in the last five words? But he lied unto him. He lied unto him. This, this man said an angel spanked the word of God to him, but he lied unto him. Now, you know what? I don't even know for sure that that man knew that he was lying. I don't know for sure. It's very possible that he heard something. It's very possible that there was some angel. It wouldn't have been an angel from God. But maybe he heard something. You know what? This man had not been serving the Lord. It's very clear, just as you read the passage. This man had not been walking with God. And here's the thing that can happen to every one of us, is we can begin to get away from the things of the Lord as believers. And we don't stay in that Bible. And we don't stay in prayer as we ought to. And then we become vulnerable. We become vulnerable to... Uh, well, to our old nature, we become vulnerable to the things of the world. All of a sudden, you know, we're starting to believe things that, uh, oh, are so important that really have no significance at all. All right, I can go into a whole bunch of illustrations or examples of that. But folks, we begin to just go off on a trail, and then we become vulnerable to the devil and what the devil is trying to do to us and to our old nature and to the things of this world. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we certainly can. And that's exactly what's taken place here. He said, yes, an angel spoke to me. And he told me to invite you and bring you in for some bread. And so then he goes on here and he says, so he went back with him in verse 19 and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Listen, realize today, Christian, that what David said when he fled from Saul, David said this, there is but a step between me and death. And there is a step between us and death, spiritually speaking. There's a, there's a pitfall out there. There's obstacles out there that if we don't walk with the Lord and keep our eyes on him and listen to what he tells us to do, then we can find ourselves getting tangled up in the weeds. We can find ourselves getting in a whole lot of trouble. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, see ye then that ye walk cir circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The Bible says we're to walk circumspectly in this Christian life. We're to look unto the Lord and say, Lord, give me discernment. Help me to make the right decisions. Help me to walk in the light as you are in the light so that we can have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And that's 1 John chapter 1, that we would walk in the light and stay in the light. And when we get tripped up and when we make a foolish decision and we sin, just get our hearts right and get right back walking with the Lord again. And I want to challenge you to do that, and I challenge myself to do that as well. And so now you've got this man of God who, listen, an angel spoke to you? Oh, yeah, that angel said to come to my house. Well, was that the, uh, was that the, uh, the original instructions and commandment that the Lord gave to that man of God? You, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. But he hears this man and he says, well, this is another prophet. An angel spoke to you and said that I could go and eat at, eat, eat at your house and have a meal with you. And so we take a look at this last scene. And that is the man of God's dismal ending. It's just sad. And what we have here is a very sad ending to what looked like a great beginning. Because it was a great beginning. He was faithful to do what God called him to do. But a great beginning does not make a, a, a great life. All right? A great life is, is a life that's lived all the way through for the Lord. 
Listen, a good first and second and third inning does not ensure that you finish on top. You've got to put together a whole life from start to finish. In fact, better it is to start bad and finish well than vice versa. Yeah, because, listen, you can have a bad stretch, but where that bad stretch is is so important. It's better to have that bad stretch to begin with, but just finish well. And we all have that before us because the future is ahead of us. May we be determined that we're going to do the right thing. Verses 20 through 22 now, it says this, And it came to pass as they sat at the table. I want you to listen to this. This is, uh, it just blows my mind from way back and reading this way back to just recently reading it again and for this message. It came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. So now the old man hears from the Lord. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, instead you came back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. Wow, think about this. What a rebuke. What a rebuke to the man of God to have the one who sought you and showered you with compliments now be the one who prophesies to you your death sentence. What? I mean, he was the one that tripped him up. He was the one that followed him and said, hey, an angel spoke to me, and you're to come and have dinner at my home. And now, while they're eating, he comes now with, with the word of the Lord and says, you've made a wrong decision. It'll now cost you your life. What a trap. Boy, what a trap. Listen, Satan is looking to flatter you today. Satan is looking to... Uh, make you vulnerable. He's looking to use whatever he can use to trip you and I up. All the while, he's spreading a net at your feet. It says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 5, a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Did you hear that? A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Now, I want you to think about when that man was under that oak tree, when that man was under the oak tree, the man of God, you think about what that may represent. What does that represent for you and I? Maybe, it, maybe it's getting complacent. God has used you. Maybe he's used you through your life, and maybe you're a little bit on the older side because we have a lot of seniors, and maybe it comes to your mind, well, you know what? I've served the Lord all these years and now, you don't say it in your heart, but now maybe inside your, you know, uh, just in your actions, you start thinking, oh, I'm just going to get a little complacent. It's just kind of time to retire. Uh, and you know what happens is we get a little lazy. Maybe that's what that oak tree represents. Uh, maybe it's just becoming too satisfied. You're satisfied with what you've accomplished up till now. And you feel like, well, you know, look, God has been able to use me, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I'm satisfied with that. But you know what? The Bible never teaches us to just become satisfied, and that's good. No, the Lord tells us, no, we always strive higher. We're to always strive higher. And maybe it's in your heart today to just begin to feel like, no, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with where I've come in my life. Listen, you're in a dangerous place. And I'm in a dangerous place. Maybe it's not recognizing what the true finish line is. Maybe sometimes we think, oh, I've already gotten through my finish line. No, as far as I know, the finish line is when this life is over. Yeah. Amen? And so maybe in your heart you're thinking, oh, I've already gotten to that finish line. And I'm already, you know, uh, of an older age. Or I've already done all these things. So I'm really speaking to the seniors here. Listen. No, that finish line is when our life's over. And again, maybe it's just celebrating our accomplishments, you know, just being under that, under that oak tree. I'm just celebrating what just took place. Rather than, no, I have no cause, no reason to celebrate. 
o over this, you know, this victory that I just got. Because the victory was the Lord's. But we've got to recognize that. That anything that the Lord does through you or anything that the Lord does through me, it's all to his glory. And we've got to come to grips with that and not take an ounce of the glory from the Lord because it all belongs to him. Amen. So whatever that being under that, that oak tree might represent, I think it represents a lot of things. And maybe the Lord at this time maybe is, is applying it to your heart as he speaks to my heart as well. Lord, whatever it is that that oak tree represents, it's a place where he should not have camped. Not even for five minutes. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, with no doubt. He shouldn't have been there for, for any amount of time. That is why we must be sober, be vigilant. Isn't that what it says? Because your adversary, that's right out of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse, verse 8. That is why we must be sober, vigilant, because your adversary... The devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And look what it says here in verses 23 and 24. He said, and it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. So what do we learn from this whole thing? Well, I sure hope it makes us realize that victory today does not ensure victory tomorrow. It never has and it never will. I can't help but see the importance of just fully obeying God. We need to obey the Lord uh, of doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. And, and hopefully you see of doing exactly what God's called you to do fully and completely. You know, this man of God did, did a great, you know, he had a, first, a, a great first, second, and third inning. But then he started to wobble in those middle innings. And he didn't keep his eyes on the Lord. He didn't look all the way to the finish line. So may we think about how we're to do something, we're to do it fully and completely. I want you to take a look at a great verse. I think this might be Brother Jordan's favorite verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a great verse for us to, to just be exhorted by. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we want to make sure not to rest on any of our past accomplishments, let this verse right here, verse 58, be our motivation to do what's right. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Be ye steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're told to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding. And it doesn't say up until the point when you get to be a certain age. No. We're to be faithful all the way to the end. And some of you might say, well, Pastor Garcia, I don't have the ability to do some of the things I used to. Then, then we look to the Lord and he shifts, we shift into another gear. The Lord takes us up to another road. You know, one of the things I think that you can best do, maybe for some that maybe have gotten a little older and you feel like the energy is not there and you feel like, I can't do the things I used to. Then you could probably do the greatest thing, and that's pray. Amen. You know, it's, it's always great for churches to have prayer warriors, and we have a lot of men that love to pray. And if you're, and I'll just put it this way, if you feel like you're reduced to not being able to do a whole lot, you can do the best thing. You can just be praying more. You say, I'm just going to give myself under prayer like David said, and just to do what God's called you to do. But li listen, be careful that uh, you don't uh, get under that oak tree and, and begin to do whatever that young man did, whatever that man of God did as he was under that oak tree. It just began to maybe think about what just took place. And he just made himself vulnerable for somebody that was coming. May we just do what God's called us to do and be faithful so that one day that we can finish strong. Amen? Amen. So that we can finish strong. That's my prayer for you and uh, that's my prayer for myself. 
I, I want to I finish my course. I want to do what it says there. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. How many of you that know the Lord want that in your life? Yeah. Now, if you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ, then I want to see you get saved. We'd love to see you get saved today. And that would be our, you know, our, our invitation to you is to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So with that, I'm going to have you bow your heads right now. And we'll go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment with, with your heads bowed. And you're in a spirit and an attitude of prayer. Maybe God's spoken to your heart. You took a look at what we saw with this man of God who did right. And he responded and he was bold and it looked as if he was willing to give his life up if he needed to. But, but he fell prey to something down the road. He didn't listen to his initial commandment from the Lord and didn't stay with that. That's why we need to stay in this book. That's why we need to stay in prayer, that we would stay in the will of God and doing what God has called us to do. Maybe there's been a pulling away and, and straying off the path in your life. And this is a good time to talk to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. I, sometimes I feel like I can stray. And sometimes I don't always keep my eye on the prize. Sometimes I take my eyes off of that finish line and I get caught up with things that I shouldn't. Will you help me, Lord? Help me to get that focus on the right things. For those of you that know Christ, I would just encourage you to just respond to the Lord and just seek his face. Now, if you're here today without Christ, then I want to encourage you to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. As we sing this invitation hymn, you can step out in the aisle and come to the front. We'll show you from God's word how you can be saved, how you can know you're on your way to heaven. That is the most important thing that we can do in this life is to receive that gift of eternal life that the Lord offers to every one of us. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. What a, what a tragedy we read in this story about this man of God. What a great start. And he responded to you and he did the right thing, but then he listened to the wrong voice and he turned away. And it, uh, it turned out so tragic for him. Lord, help us. Lord, we're, we're just as vulnerable if we get our eyes off of you. Help us to walk with you every day. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to stay in this book and help us to pray regularly. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do that. I pray, Father, for whoever needs to respond today that you'll speak to their heart and that we would all respond in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand with a hymn book and brother. Jesus paid it all.